Um, I wanted to acknowledge that we're on the uh, territory of, uh, originally of Anishinaabe, uh, shared territory of Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, and Mississauga peoples. Um, uh, more recently, particularly, right, the new credit First Nation of the larger Mississauga Nation, and these were treaty relationships that settlers got invited into uh, at Niagara in 1764. Um, and obviously, uh, there's uh, a lot of work to do uh, today uh, in order to um, redress the violation of those uh, various treaty promises and undertakings. So, um, yeah, my co-author, uh, Jordan Stanger Ross, can't be here because he's busy running a five and a half million dollar grant, um, one of whose minor outcomes was some of the research uh, that he contributed to this paper. The paper is called Impermanent Apologies, and it's about the relationship, um, looking at two different cases, uh, the relationship uh, that we see between the question of timing in apologies and the question of public knowledge. Uh, knowledge in the apology, knowledge that informs the apology. And I think really here in the paper, what we want to do is tackle, confront, undermine a little bit two presumptions out there about apologies. One of them is a kind of popular presumption. It's a kind of folkloric presumption, uh, but I think it creeps into the literature as well. And this presumption is that a political apology is like a well-conducted criminal trial uh, that creates a kind of conclusive evidentiary base. And that normatively, the reason for creating this kind of conclusive evidentiary base is so that the apology can close the book on a sad chapter, turn the page, offer closure, allow us to move on, and so on and so forth. Governments talk this way endlessly. Critical theory, at least certain strains in critical theory, dismiss political apologies for the same reason. Um, and that's why I was kind of saying, well, why should we assume that collective apologies are about forgiveness? Um, sure, apologetic actors approach them uh, with that purpose in mind, but that doesn't mean uh, that we ought to endorse uh, forgiveness, for example, um, as normatively speaking, an outcome that ought to follow an apology. The second presumption, um, beyond the kind of apologies are verdicative so that you can close the books, uh, the second presumption we want to tackle here, it's sometimes seen in the apology literature itself. Um, but I want to note first off that the apology literature as a whole doesn't say that much about the relation between timing and knowledge. Um, there's certainly, a, a Nicholas Tavuchis talks about the kairos of apology an apology that comes too soon, you know, immediately after the offense has been committed is seen as kind of glib, cheap, might not be accepted for that reason. Apology too late, well, it's the whole too little, too late thing. Why didn't you uh, get to this when uh, people were still alive to hear you? Um, the psychologist Aaron Lazar uh, disagrees actually with Tavuchis, saying that in principle, it's never too late to apologize. Um, individual apologies can be too late, but not necessarily so. But beyond that, the more specific position in the apology literature um, about timing that we're interested in here in this paper comes out of specifically transitional justice scholars who are thinking about the relation between apologies in the broader architecture um, of transitions and reckoning with gross historical wrongdoing. The law scholar Rudy Tietel says that the gold standard of apology in transitional justice is what she calls the transitional apology. And the transitional apology has a very specific uh, relation to timing and knowledge. The transitional apology comes after, only after, there has been an official inquiry into the injustices that are at issue. The transitional apology then kind of symbolically ratifies and embraces the findings of the inquiry, uh, restates those findings, and apologizes for the wrongs and in doing this kind of inaugurates the transition. Um, another transitional scholar, uh, transitional justice scholar, uh, Robert Rotberg, uh, agrees very much with Tietel and says you have to time apologies so that they come after there's been some kind of major official inquiry so that the apology is informationally complete. And I think that the transitional justice view, to the extent that there is this kind of view um, out there, 
is related to the folkloric view that apologies should impose closure by resting on a complete evidentiary base, is this, is I think they're related in the sense that they both assume that apologies are one-offs. There's only going to be one apology, so the apology has to be timed so that there is a kind of complete record. You have to have all the facts in first. You don't want to rush the apology off before we know everything there is to be known. And that's going to be particularly a concern if you think that apologies only happen once and that they're conclusive and that they close the books. So we're concerned about these presumptions. We're tackling these presumptions in the paper for a bunch of reasons. But the reason I want to focus on here is because we each, my co-author Jordan Stengeross and myself, wound up doing research, getting involved with particular cases of apology that made us question these presumptions about closure, finality, one-offs, that they're vindicative and so on. And these are apologies relating to Japanese Canadian internment and Indigenous residential schooling. And I'm going to assume that people are basically familiar with the kind of basic details of Japanese Canadian internment and Indigenous residential schools. What I'm particularly interested in here are the specific histories of apology surrounding these particular injustices. And in terms of histories of apology, Jeff Olick and Barbara Nistel and other scholars remind us that memory has a history as well, right? So apologies have history. So the histories of apology that made us start questioning this one-off conclusive finality view. First, and this one is probably little known, in 2013 the city of Vancouver apologized for the Japanese Canadian internment. There had been prior apologies, notably by the Canadian federal government in 1988. Vancouver apologized in 2013 and the apology framed the city's role in internment as kind of, well, there was a racist climate in the city that allowed the internment of 23,000 Japanese Canadians in World War II. And the city was guilty of inaction. We were complicit. We didn't do anything. We didn't stop it. However, subsequent research, and this is my colleague Jordan Sanger-Ross and his Landscapes of Injustice project, unearthed, in fact, that Vancouver had done a lot more than presided over a climate of racism and inaction. The city of Vancouver was actually the key mover behind specifically the dispossession of Japanese Canadians. When Japanese Canadians were interned, their property was going to be held in trust and released to them after the war, and the city started eyeing up the properties and marshaled a whole bunch of city resources to convince the federal government that these properties constituted a slum, that it was an undesirable thing to have in the city, and it would be much more productive, kind of like urban renewal, right? I mean, Africville would be an interesting one to compare in this regard. And long story short, the uh, city view prevailed, and Japanese Canadians were dispossessed. So, wow. Right? They apologized in 2013 for, well, we didn't do anything to stop it. And we find out a couple of years later, whoa, you did a lot more than that. You made these people lose their homes and businesses forever. 2008, Indigenous Residential Schools Apology. It's other kind of interesting case. Now, it's not about new research exposing something about residential schooling that we didn't know before. But it's about an official inquiry helping influentially to reframe Canadian understandings of residential schooling, a reframing that moves in directions uh, very different from the 2008 apology. So in the 2008 apology, um, the Prime Minister presented residential schooling as motivated by prejudice, as motivated by notions of white superiority. Um, fairly frank about the brutality that went on in the schools and the specific injustices of the schooling, but in terms of the underlying motivations, um, framed these as motivated by prejudice and disrespect, whereas we know from the 2015 Truth and Reconciliation Commission, and we would know from Indigenous uh, voices long before that, if, if people had been listening, that the schools were in fact instruments of land and sovereignty dispossession. 
that the residential schooling agenda was not just like, oh, these people aren't as good as us, so we're going to make them as good as us. It's these people have relations to land and existing sovereignties that need to be replaced by our relation to land and our sovereignties, and that's what the abduction of children for residential schooling was all about. So at first blush, when you look at those histories of apology, apologies that wind up in some sense getting undone or seeming woefully insufficient because of subsequent inquiry and knowledge expansion, <coughs> at first blush, that kind of transitional justice approach to the apology seems correct. That you want to wait until all the facts are in. You want to make sure that you have an official inquiry that unearths everything we need to know about the injustices, and then you can make sure that you have a good apology. So Vancouver should have waited for the Landscapes of Injustice project to have completed its work. Prime Minister Harper should have waited for the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, which actually he kept on saying he wanted to do. Um, not, I think, because he was hoping to win three more terms and then deliver the most fulsome residential school apology possibly. He thought this was, you know, was a delay tactic for him, but that's what he said. We should wait for the TRC. Maybe he should have, right? We don't say this. That's exactly what we don't say in the paper. And this is why we're trying to kind of challenge the normative assumption that apologies are meant to be one-offs that enclose the record somehow and are informationally complete and put an end uh, to everything. So one reason for not, like in the simplest way, one reason for not saying that Vancouver should have waited reason for not saying that Harper should have waited is just simply the reason of respect. If survivors want an apology, especially if many survivors are elderly, um, who am I, who is anybody else to tell them, no, 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 you've got to wait. You've got to wait. We need to get all the facts in. There's going to be an inquiry. Hold tight. Furthermore, it, we're not even convinced or Actually, let me put it this way. We're not concerned to say in this paper that the apologies should have been better informed. You could certainly say that. You could say that Stephen Harper uh, should have read more literature on settler colonial studies and understood what residential schooling really was about. You, you could say that. We're not saying that in this paper. We're more interested in what the papers show us analytically uh, about the dynamics of the relation between timing and public knowledge in political apology. Here's the account overall. I think when you look at these cases, and the relationship between these apologies, the activism that came before, the inquiry that came after, that it makes sense to see apologies not as one-offs, but as installments in longer run processes of historical justice. And there are installments in longer run processes of historical justice that are nested in unequal social relations. And because they're nested in unequal social relations, it means that there's going to be a lot of opacity surrounding apology. Key facts are going to be buried, responsibility is going to be denied, and those who have an interest in burying facts and denying responsibility are in the kinds of positions that lets them do those sorts of things. And furthermore, they're going to these relations of inequality, once the facts start to emerge, still the injustices are going to be framed in ways that minimize the significance of the wrongdoing, that fail to name the ethical systems and ethical failings that allowed the wrongdoings to happen. They're going to euphemize the wrongs. They're going to present as cultural disrespect, uh, for example, what really was an agenda of genocide. So given that, that apologies, it makes sense to see them as installments in historical justice processes that are shaped by unequal social relations, it means it's going to be incredibly tough, if not impossible, to get anything like uh, what Nick Smith calls a categorical apology when you're talking about relations between historically victimized and oppressed groups and powerful states and dominant social majorities. So if that's the case, why assume that you could time an apology so that it would be the last word? 
Why assume that we're ever going to be at that perfect informational moment where we've got all the facts on the table and the ethical system has properly been named and understood? Why insist on timing an apology, given the impossibility of timing the apology that way? So I think that militates against seeing apologies as one-offs. I think that that's a series of reasons why we should fight and warn against closure assumptions in the world of political apology. I think the other point we want to get across is about the apologies themselves and their role in these processes of historical reckoning nested in unequal social relations which is that the apologies, and this is why we call them impermanent apologies, they actually seem interestingly disposed um, to undermine themselves. There's something about the apology that helps to contribute to the state of affairs that then allows people after the apology to look back at it and go, how incomplete that was. They failed to name the crime. So I'll just schematically um, rather than giving specifics, because I know we want to get into uh, Maya's presentation and, and discussion here, uh, just kind of schematic account of how the apology processes we're concerned with illustrate the ways in which apologies kind of undermine themselves. So the origin of apology in political apology, it's almost always in the struggle of survivors uh, and survivor descendants for reparation and reckoning. In those processes, survivor groups and their advocates wind up strengthening their organizations, they wind up strengthening their networks, they wind up creating more societal awareness, and one possible outcome then are initial apologies. Those apologies, in turn, can strengthen the voice of survivor groups, like, for example, the 1988 Japanese-Canadian Redress Agreement, wound up providing um, funding that dramatically strengthened the public organizations of Japanese Canadians and put them in a better position to do more memory work on the internment that then wound up informing uh, the landscapes of injustice project that showed how bad the Vancouver apology was. Or if the apology doesn't directly kind of wind up with some kind of victory that strengthens uh, survivor groups and allows them to press for further knowledge and inquiry, Sometimes the inadequacy of an apology is something that strengthens the survivor group and gets them focused on what was inadequate about the apology. And so the 1998 kind of quasi-residential schools apology, well, we're sorry for the abuse. Then that allows the narrative struggle to focus on, hey, 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 it wasn't that abuse happened in the schools, it was that the schools were abusive. Then the 2008 apology, well, yes, now we realize the schools were abusive that then allows or helps uh, facilitate the next stage of narrative struggle in which it's okay, now that it's been admitted that the schools were abusive, what was the policy about? What were they trying to do? Why was this system of abuse created? And the TRC comes along and helps to make people hear uh, the answer to that question, uh, which is the schools were part of a larger scheme um, of genocide, cultural or otherwise. So the point is that apologies in various ways strengthen survivor groups, focus more attention on the injustices, even bad apologies, um, help for more focused narrative struggles, they, they at least can do that, uh, that the apologies are themselves contributing to subsequent activism and subsequent inquiry that then winds up shining a light back that exposes the inadequacy of the apology. So if you see it that way, it's not that the Vancouver apology in 2013 or the Harper apology in 2008 were necessarily awful or apologies. It's not that they shouldn't have happened. It's that we need to stop thinking about them as one-offs. States do it by talking about closing chapters, uh, people who categorically dismiss political apologies as devious neoliberal instruments of late capitalist trickery uh, that close the books on historical injustice, I think, take a similar view. And we want to advocate instead here a more processual, iterative view of apologies 
uh, a view that we see already in all kinds of other areas of historical justice study, in museumology, memory studies, where muse uh, exhibits and monuments are seen as defeasible texts, uh, contributions to broader processes that are incomplete, that get undone. Uh, in democratic theory terms, an agonistic approach to reckoning with historical wrong, rather than the kind of Habermasian and deliberative theory, we're going to get everything right, and here's all the rules. Um, and then when we come to a conclusion, it's binding. Uh, the agonistic approach, we're in a relationship here. We're going to struggle over this. And what matters is the two parties being able to kind of keep on doing this. I think indigenous condolence rituals um, have some of those agonistic features. So to finally uh, just wrap all this up, for us, what this means is that sometimes even a weak apology is not too soon uh, and has a lot more value, I think, sometimes than critics of apology want to, um, to credit them with. And that against the best planning of the apologizer, the, apologi the apology itself can kind of contribute to these processes that wind up undermining the apology, defeating the apologizer's um, attempts at closure. And I think if we understand that, uh, we can better under, uh, respond to the urgency of survivors uh, when they're seeking apologies, um, rather than telling them to wait. And we can fight the closure assumption that is so often used uh, to silence survivors, and is used the closure assumption is used to kind of try to weaponize apologies, uh, to use them to make people be quiet. I think if we start understanding them as defeasible and impermanent, we can move towards a better apology practice. <clears throat>